I'm very excited about this particular session, um, Business as a Force of a Nation, an Architect as Social Engineer. And, and I am for many reasons, because when we were thinking about the theme of this um, session, um, I knew that one of the prominent speakers we had to bring was someone who had done business successfully, you know, not only on the local front, but also on the global front. And most importantly, even an industry that, you know, it maybe may not be so much talked about, but, you know, personally, when we look through the speakers to bring, it was a no-brainer to bring this amazing speaker we have on stage. I'm going to introduce her in a bit, and you should get ready to applaud the powerhouse that you have in front of you. She's coercing you. <laughs> <laughs> I personally am a fan. I'm starstruck, so please allow me. <laughs> Mrs. Olajumoke Adenowo is Africa's most influential female architect, a transformational leader, business builder, and philanthropist, and the founder of the internationally recognized firm AD Consultant. With a successful 34-year career as an exceptional leader in architecture, she had served in various leadership positions for women and youth initiative. She's a recipient of the Forbes Women Africa Entrepreneur Award and recognized as New Africa Businesswoman of the Year, a true polymath and is on the 50 over 50 list you know, with Forbes. And her impact in leadership and philanthropy has earned her recognition by the Congress of the United States. Please welcome with me, Mrs. Olajimoke Adeni. Thank you. You're most kind. There we go. Okay. Hmm. Where do we start this conversation? You know, I... When I, when I look through your life story, one thing that you know, amazed me was how, you know, as a teenager, you entered university at the age of 14, um, and you were an award-winning undergraduate. Then you now went to get a master's degree and came out with a distinction. So it just looked like you just had so much clarity as a young person. So just, I'm just curious to know, what sparked this level of clarity at such a young age? OK, thank you very much for inviting me to this forum, and thank you so much for the warm applause. That was so good of you. You can do it again. <laughs> thank you. So I hope we're going to have, what kind of conversation do you want us to have? A polite, nice one, or a truthful, authentic one? Truthful. Should truthful, I speak authentic. unafraid of being canceled, or? <laughs> OK, so let's have a truthful, authentic. That's what you deserve for showing up. So thank you for coming. Clarity early in life. I was an only child for quite a while an only child of two professors, male and female. My father, professor of history, my mother, professor of criminology. So I was basically mentored by adults. So I played with my Lego, my chemistry set, and I reflected a lot. That's what it was. So maybe that would bring clarity, because I had no kids my age to play with. And I played football with the guys. I was a goalkeeper. I was very good. You know, no, I was. I was. I was. I was good. People have injuries from when I played football. So, but you see, I. It meant that I, I, I reflected a lot as a child. I thought the way children normally would not you know, think. Also, maybe because I was an only child and it was, babysitters were expensive, when my parents were traveling, they would t take me with them. So as a toddler, I toured Europe and the UK as a child. By the time I was three years old, we'd done a European tour. And that had taught me a lot of things. Number one, that mankind is different but equal. Mm -hmm. Because a three-year-old will know that, because I have not been programmed. Mm -hmm. My paradigms are clean. Different but equal. Immediately, I knew that the presence of melanin in someone's skin cannot become a constraint or a ceiling. That's right. I know that sounds That's so right. simplistic, but it cannot be that the pigment will keep me back from being who I should be or optimizing potential. We had done a European tour, of course, so I'd gone seeing i been exposed to buildings like Versailles, you know, as a child, and also I learned a lot about leadership even as a child because I'd ask my dad, so that, this is Marie Antoinette I'm pointing to, this lady, what happened to her? She was guillotined. Okay, maybe because she's an adult she was guillotined. How about the Dauphin? He was guillotined. A child was guillotined. So at that age, I realized immediately that when the poor have nothing to eat, they eat the rich. Hmm. I That's immediately right. understood, even at that age, that if a country doesn't have a middle class, mm. when you press a people to the wall, mm. they rebound against you mm. and they tear you down. Mm. 
So even then, I began to, fo began to form my own ideas about leadership. Mm -hmm. So this is what gave me clarity so early. I understood that you can't, it's almost like a country is like a sea, right? And you're on a raft. The raft is the middle class. If you're going to be this heavy person carrying bags of gold, you better make sure that the raft is strong, the middle class is buoyant, or else you will sink into the ocean of the masses. Okay. And that's what I saw happen in Versailles. So even at that age, I would think, I've lost sound, I would think, why, why is Africa, because I started first with Africa, at two, I went to Benin. Hmm. Why does Africa has, have such vast potential? But why is it not optimized, hmm. even as a child? Yeah. So this was a very unusual childhood yeah. journey, but maybe that's what gave clarity. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I like that you, you, you talked about, you know, just being in that uh, type of household, you know, home where your parents were very intentional about exposing you at the age. And then now moving on to leadership, you, talk, you talked about how that also helped you understand leadership. At a young age of 25, you actually started your company, AD Consulting. I'm, like, I'm an entrepreneur, probably started my business in my 30s. But starting an architectural company... I didn't company, know you were in your 30s. <laughs> No, for it. <laughs> Mrs. A. <laughs> Mrs. A, you know, um, yeah, this is the off camera. Please cut that out. My sisters are there. So, um, so it, at the age of 25, you mm -hmm. started, you know, your, your architectural firm. And you've worked with so many international clients. Um, you were, you know, very keen designing the Federal Ministry of, you know, Abuja. Um, you've worked with Coca-Cola, Laurel, all these things. How has all these experiences shaped you in understanding problem-solving skills and leadership skills. You know, people think architecture is just far-fetched. But you have a very unique journey, Mrs. Adeno. How has that experience in all these international projects helped in shaping your leadership and problem-solving skills? You see, I knew that architecture is the world's most difficult course. I know you're studying something to clap for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew, and then I, I couldn't really, I'll try my best to explain, because it is the art and science of design. Most people are either good in the arts or in sciences. So you can imagine someone who can do calculus and at the same time can draw and can paint mm. in watercolors. There are not many people like that, right? So, until Harvard Business School came out and said the world's most difficult courses, architecture number one, chemical engineering number two, I was like, duh, I knew that. <laughs> that was my life. We had a lot of people study architecture and not come out too well because they should have been engineers. Mm. Do you see? Mm. Okay. So, architecture is problem solving. The corollary between leadership and architecture, it's too direct. Yeah. That's right. Architecture is representing stakeholders for a desirable outcome. It's not your vision you are birthing. You are midwifing somebody else's vision. Leadership should be that, should be. You shouldn't put yourself up for leadership because you want to achieve your own agenda. You should be there in leadership because others are asking you to represent them while they take care of other things. They be doctors, they go to side business school, they do all that. You go to the center and make things work. So there's division of labor and we can see to other things. So. An architect number one is a vision caster. Mm. It's an empty plot of land, we choose which site. We can see what is not there yet. A leader should be able to see what does not exist yet. That's right. A leader should be able to put, take you towards a desirable future. This is what Kenya is going to be in 15 years time. Or Japan, and there's nothing. So what are we going to do so that in 50 years time we get there? Mm. Paint such a vision that you can delay gratification Put down your money, you know, let go of things to go there. So that's number one. So we have blueprints, we have fly-throughs, we have whatever. But it is important that we paint a vision, which means, two, we must be good communicators. Mm. Whichever way you're communicating the vision, is it visual, is it verbal, whichever way. And a leader, when you're done, you say, I have a dream. <laughs> and nobody, everybody wants a good dream. Let's just go for the dream. So that is leadership, too. Mm. And leadership also, it's about m handling men, material, and money to make sure you have the desirable outcome. Mm. And that's what architects do. Mm. We're universal agents for the client to make sure that you have a desirable outcome. I will go on and on, but I need to say again mm. that we handle teams. Mm. Teams from the sublime to the whichever, so from the laborers to the quantity surveyors who work with us to the engineers. Architects handle teams. That means we have to make sure that we know everything about a little and a little about your everything. 
which is what a leader does. The story is told. <clears throat> Disclaimer. If you say I said it, I would deny it. <laughs> so in Nigeria, I grew up under military rule. I would wake up to martial music all the time. The government has changed again. Mm. Now, it wouldn't matter to the adults. To me, in primary three, it mattered. It meant social studies. There were 12 governors, now they're 19. Then they're going to be 12. So we start to cram again. Say, Which one is Upo again? Say, Upo is Rivers. You know what? It was, it was like, can you stop changing this government? But you know, at that time, SAP, yeah. the secretary to the federal government was, was Olufalaye, whose son, interestingly, lived with us on campus. You know, DG, late DG lived in our house. And, um, we were going to take the structural as adjustment program, right? As yeah. a program in Nigeria. You might be too young to know. No. But in my no, we're not <laughs> Thank you. We're dating each other now. They know that. They know we're dated. They know we're dated. And I lived in an area where the Naira went from one dollar twenty to a Naira to what it is when I was leaving London. I don't know what it is now. Because it's been a whole two hours since I left London. <laughs> I don't know where the Naira is at. But how did it happen? It started with SAP. As they were going for the meeting where the secretary to the federal government was going to present SAP, Babangida is reputed to have said, somebody said, so what is this about? The other general said, we don't know. But let us go and hear what Olu has to say. It's not acceptable. Chief Obafemi Aolowo, in his book when he was talking about the railway that Nigeria was going to spin up, he knew the gauge of the railway. That's what real African leaders looked like then. The gauge of the railway. So when you have a situation before you as architects, you dissect the problem. It might be somebody wants me to do a vineyard, a winery, for instance. I have to understand how, do, how does it work in the humid regions? What do you know? Know everything about that subject mm. and not outsource it to somebody to read for me and give me a four page review. Mm. Do you get what I'm yes. trying to say? So th there's a lot I can say, but we represent stakeholders and we manage resources on behalf of stakeholders. And the vision and the agenda is not ours, it's for others. And we have not yet succeeded until we make your vision come to pass, which is why you should patronize AD Consulting. It's not a plug. <laughs> it's not, I'm just saying, I'm there for your vision. Thank you so much, Mr. Yes. Um This is fantastic. Before I move to my next question, I'm seeing this beautiful picture oh. of your one of your of your designs. So she I just asked for it. so yeah. So quickly in just two minutes, can you just take us through the designs? This is and and she's done over 120 design or 120. Be, I'm I'm trying to be very humble here. I'm telling you, over 120. Just take us through just in two minutes, and then I'll give you the next question. Okay, take you through. The just, just tell design. us maybe what was this uh, what was this for uh, the purpose? Just. This is a client's house in Pinock Beach. This is another one. I call it the Wave. It's in, it's 829 VGC. This is Rain Oil headquarters. I also designed the mobile that you can see in the atrium. Why are we doing this? This is staircase. <laughs> <laughs> this is staircase in AD Consulting, and this is AD Consulting, my studio. I designed the um, sculpture as I call it burglar art. It's functional art because you know we do we live behind burglar bars from South Africa all the way to Senegal. It's just the truth. Mm. So you build your beautiful edifice and now have to keep others out. So instead of designing prison bars, what I did was this <laughs> sculpture. <laughs> So, like I said, you need to know everything mm -hmm. about a little. I know I needed a sculpture, so I gave a sketch to a sculptor, and mm. that's what you have. So it keeps, there's no part of this sculpture that you can put your head through. <laughs> yeah, what that means, sir, is that a human being cannot pass through. If a head cannot pass, you can't pass. Mm. So as much as I'm depicting Lagos rising from the waves, I'm making sure it's totally functional. But we'll come to what functional art means to Africans later. There's no piece of art in, in Africa that is meant to be looked at. Hmm. So when they take your masks to New York, it's somebody's forefather and grandfather they just carried to New York. It's not to be looked at. There's no art for art's sake in Africa, just to be gazed at. Hmm. So the British Museum is full of ton pages from African history, especially from a, for a culture where most of our history was not written. So there are gaps in our narratives as people of Africa. 
Okay, you Thank didn't you. ask for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's Thank you so much. Studio. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Adenawa. Um, yeah. There's a saying you always make. You say it's better to light a candle than cause the darkness. Mm. And you know, when I just reflect on the word candle, just it just almost like you bring illumination to a place. You bring hope. You bring light. And reflecting on your journey, still at very young ages, you had so much clarity as a young person. At the age of 30. You, you, you know, you founded a philanthropy. You started um, Awesome Treasures Foundation. Um, this organization is on six continents, recognized by the United States, by the you, you know um, United Nations Congress. Mm. And you know, you've done so much. I've personally, you know, engaged with that you know um, foundation on some level. So maybe the question is, why start a philanthropy at that young age? That's one. And just. How is the work you're doing with Awesome Treasures Foundation, how has it been um, impactful in when we have a view on, of nation building? Why did I start a philanthropy at that young age? Well, I started business the way everybody starts. You want to do great in business, right? Until it became clear that trying to do great in business in an environment, in a hostile ecosystem, is like trying to, to be in first class in a plane that's going to crash. Well, going down. <laughs> So it was clear so early to me, there was no point. The best African architect, what's going to happen? So I was a barefoot philanthropist. I thought, why I always say it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness is that I didn't have enough to give back, and I was giving back. Hmm. At least there was something in my hand, no matter how little, which is my, my, my charge to you too. You can do something. You have something to give. You can mentor a child. You can speak words of encouragement. You can, you can make a change. Everybody has something to give. Right. I noticed that it became a fashion in Nigeria to have a foundation. You turn 50, you know, and you're now loaded, like, what do I do next? <laughs> ah, I need a foundation. <laughs> no, it comes from within. It comes from a love of humanity. That's why it's called philanthropy, liking human beings. So that's what made me do that. I said, instead of joining in Nigeria, it's interesting. A bus conductor has uh, not, OK, I don't, I, they don't wear uniform and caps, get? Okay? But a bus conductor has an opinion on what the government should be doing. The government should, the government should. Everybody knows what the government should be doing, what sex should be doing. What that, nobody is doing anything to contribute beyond discourse. So I thought you are either part of the problem or part, part of the solution. solution. Yeah. And I decide it is better to light a candle. It's just a tiny, a candle is a little light than to be cursing the darkness when everybody else is cursing the darkness. So I thought, look, business people have to get involved. Yeah, that's right. It's about transformational governance. We should be the ones at the, that's the interface between business and nation building. We should be the ones at the forefront of creating peace, justice and strong institutions. Africans overblow the presidency. The presidency is just one of the pillars of society. It's, a, it's the executive, but we have the legislature, we have the judiciary. So in one of my books, Beyond My Dreams, I wrote a, a work of fiction, because there's no other way to get African ladies to get interested in governance the picture of the book than here. to wrap it around <laughs> a steaming hot romance. <laughs> Mrs. I don't know. I think we have the picture of the book here. Uh, Let's no, go it's Beyond to My end. Dreams. I don't yeah. think. I, but I do have an old copy of Beyond My Dreams. So, in the steamiest dialogue, I'll begin to talk about revolution and Napoleon Bonaparte and yeah, we do the and next. stuff like that. Thank you. This is the old cover. It's not, it's not a biography okay. of me. No. So the new one, <laughs> the new one I have has you know a very handsome guy and girl looking longingly across <laughs> the room to each other, which is the only way I'll get you to buy it. But we're talking about, will revolution work? No. Will change through democracy and everything work? Yes. Because the people that we keep changing come from amongst us, which means it is we. We are the ones who should be the change That's right. that we're looking for. Because the bad leaders in Africa do not come from Mars. They are Africans. They just represent us. That's what they are. So. I decided that that's what we, you know, we should do. We should get involved as professionals because we just want to do our work in peace, right? But leadership will not allow us, they won't give us an ecosystem to work in. While you're budgeting, the, front, the exchange rate is changing. So if we don't do something about it, they're going to wipe us out. That's, for me, the interface between business and nation building. And when I was made um, New African Businesswoman of the Year, I remember saying, it was here in London, I said, 
until our leaders in Africa understand that the real natural resources of Africa is not the gold, it's not the petroleum, it's not the rhodium or whatever it is, it's the people of Africa. It will be the responsibility of business leaders to build the human capacity of Africa, to understand that our offices are not located on sites, we are in host communities, mentor the people we call employees. We have to be those who drive that change so that we can finally do business in peace and in a predictable way, in a peaceable society where there's justice and where there's equity. Thank you. That's that's that's. Oh, thank you. That's fantastic, and um, I really love the way you put it. Um, you know about you know how leaders should also see themselves as mentors to even employees. Yes. I think that's something that um, it's a gap that's still missing, um, whether you like it or not. But I believe that you know there's an emergence of a change in that area. Um, so I don't know what you wear a lot of hats. You know you are a philanthropist. You know entrepreneur, you're also a thought leader, and um, you were the first female, no, the first architect, actually, of African descent to have ever been published by Rizzoli. Rizzoli is actually a world-leading publisher for art, design, and architecture. And when I, when I you know, look over that, I remember your, new, your book, New Heritage. Yes, let's talk about this book. <laughs> So now looking at your book, New Heritage, you thoroughly expand on leveraging you know, African you know, heritage design principles. Um, but tell us why this is so important. And while we're working towards nation building as Africans, why should we look to our heritage to chart the future? <laughs> New heritage is an ideology and a mantra cloaked in an architecture book, as usual. We have to understand that all our agendas must be subtle but consistent. Mm. And New Heritage is about the fact that Africa must evolve its own solutions. It bears reputation. Africa must evolve its own solutions. The solutions to Africa's problems cannot be ideated thousands of miles away from where it is cost. Let me give you an example. True story, some foreign aid program came to an African village. The soil by the river was fantastic for growing tomatoes. So they were like, what is wrong with the simple villagers that they don't know that they should grow tomatoes because, or tomatoes, tomatoes, choose your choice, you know, <laughs> by, by the riverside. So they grew the tomatoes. They came out huge, beautiful. So you see, we need to teach these Africans how to do it. And then just before the harvest, they had a thunderous sound. It was hippopotamus <laughs> at the edge of the river. They trampled all the tomatoes. And the villagers got up the next day and said, that is, why. is the reason why we don't grow tomatoes. By so if you do not walk in my moccasins for a mile, the Indians will say, the Aboriginal Indians in America will say, you don't know where the shoe pinch is. So we must. A new generation of Africans must get the confidence, develop the confidence in their ability to solve their own problems by looking back and seeing that their ancestors solved their problems. <laughs> see, if you see they've done it before, you know you can do it. That's right. If you know that there was a man, Samusa, who was the richest man to date on earth, then nobody can tell you that you need to be poor or that your continent is a continent of poor people because there was a man, Samusa. Even if it is sovereign wealth. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So we look to the heritage and see what has been done in the past. And that is what new, new heritage, heritage is about. about. Look to the past. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes left. Please, if you have questions, please use the QR code and put your questions. I would soon switch into Q&A from the audience. Um, but the women in the room will forgive me if I don't ask you this question. <laughs> so, you are a female in a male-dominated industry, like shattering glass ceiling. I don't, what, is it glass? There's no ceiling. Like, you have surpassed it all. And, you know, 
can you just share with us? I'm just curious to know what kind of challenges you may have, you must have faced on your journey, and how you were able to um, rise above it. Okay. Number one thing I did not do to rise above it is join any female focused group. <laughs> women doing this, women doing that. Why? I'm in a male dominated industry. I'm, so I can count three female clients I've had in 34 years of business. So you go where you can solve your problems. You get what I'm trying to say? So there's one. I, would, I can tell stories, can't I? I wish women focus groups worked on policy. Because you see, it, it wouldn't be an ad hoc situation, but like policies like McKinsey is trying, 40% of corporate jobs should go to this and that. But you know that SMEs are the drivers of African economy. How women are more in the SME and in the informal sector. How can we help women? By making sure that the government gives a quota of contracts in whatever industry to women. Kenya has that. Is there a Kenyan in the room? <laughs> Nigeria does not. But I don't see women business groups working towards that, you know, for instance. So what did I do? First, I was purpose driven in my decision making. What is the purpose? I have only one life. What is the purpose? Why should I be on this platform? Why should I be seeing here? Two, I worked hard. Hmm. And you see, this is why I say they, nobody's going to give you a seat at a table because you are a woman. That's right. And if they do give you that token seat at the table, then you have to, oh my gosh, you, you need to continue to maintain whoever brought you there. Mm -hmm. You can put the subtext you like. <laughs> So the core values of AD Consulting and Awesome Treasures are excellence. I believe excellence is a reward in itself. So either you see me doing it or not, I will be excellent in what I do. Passion. I'm passionate about what I do. Integrity. Creativity. It spells epic, but that's just, it just happens to work that way. I made sure that you will not have any reason to say at any time, we should have given the project to a man. Hmm. So which means I'm going to Kaduna to do NUB Kaduna. I'm given three months to do NUB Kaduna because they think she's going to fail. Anyway, and I'm saying bye-bye to my nanny and TJ, my son who is now 23. As I say bye-bye to TJ, he's warm. He's having his first bout of malaria. That is major. Because you think they're going to die the first time a baby has malaria. I'm on the way to the airport already. I bundle Dorothy, the nanny, TJ, into the car, go to the pharmacist, because you have to know everything about a little, right? A little about everything. I know what malaria medicine you're going to give my child. If not, you can kill the child. And as a doctor, you bury your mistakes. I am not serving doctors, <laughs> and nobody would know. You know, so get him his malaria medication. We all fly to Kaduna and land in Kaduna together. Because, and I take care of TJ, attend my meetings, do what I have to do. Because I'm not going to allow you to say, you should have given it to a guy who doesn't have to take care of his child. When a guy shows up late at work and say, what happened? Oh, I took little Fred to get his vaccine. Everybody's like, ooh. <laughs> and when a woman says that, it's like, another vaccine. Hmm. Was well, it our polio last week? And then after that, smallpox. What, what, when are you going to come to work? So you must not, ladies, don't ever give anybody reason to say we should have called a man. So don't expect to play the female card. Oh, I was having cramps. Don't try it. Just <laughs> keep it. I don't know. It's just what it is. Do not have okay. let anybody say we should have called a man. OK. Men don't get pregnant. <laughs> she has morning sickness. Do you know all the subtext? So don't come and say I had morning sickness. I went to see the, my gynecologist. No. Nobody needs to know. Just give them the work. According to deadline, excellently, make sure no man can beat you at what you say you're doing. I said, I did architecture exams with the guys, right? Nobody gave me a pink slip because I'm a female. Mm -hmm. Here's the pink exam paper. We know you're female. The men will get blue. So your maths is, so, is easier maths. <laughs> and we passed the same exams. We mm -hmm. did everything. We went neck to neck. Yeah. So I'm not going to let anybody say we should have brought a man. And she came out with a distinction. Thank you. Yeah. She did. She did. 
So just around that, um, just still around the, you know, um, the kind of positioning women should have while they're trying to excel. Um, there's a question here that says, how do you balance wearing so many hats? Um, in business leadership and bring and you know and offering you know amongst many others, how do you balance it, Mrs. Adenova? Okay, do you want um... the real answer? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You want the real answer? The truth is, it doesn't even matter if I don't balance many hats. Living in Africa, there's a lot going on. As a wife, as a mother, there's a wedding every weekend. Have you noticed? <laughs> you know now. You see it on Instagram. <laughs> with the smoke machines and everything. <laughs> Who's your guy? <laughs> so we know how it works. So there's a lot. So you must be purpose driven. Very early in life, you must decide, this is my legacy. This is who I want to be. This is what I want to be remembered for. And that drives your decisions when you wake up in the morning. You don't need to be at every wedding, every birthday party and every everything. So learning how to say no. Not every right thing is the right thing for me. And then don't, one of the recipes for frustration is trying to please everybody. It's not gonna happen. So these are the things I'm driven by my purpose and stay true. And then when I, you now have a family, please realize that your children have only you. Yeah. If I don't come here, you call another speaker. TJ and Tolu have only one mother. They can have several friends, but they don't have a replacement for their mother. So you need to prioritize where you're needed, you know? Ah, in Nigeria, I like it. You hear, ah, no, they won't like it if I don't come. <laughs> the truth is they don't even know if you don't come. <laughs> <laughs> she also, they're hoping you don't come and you send money. <laughs> so maybe you go focus on making the money so you can send the money. So while the bride and groom are scanning the crowd, look at them stuffing their faces. <laughs> It's only Mrs. Ote that sent me 500,000 where I am, and she didn't even come. <laughs> so you really think that they're into you, but they're like, you should have sent a million and not come. Okay. <laughs> no, but after, please go for weddings, right? We need to be able to dance in, you know? You know we can't do that alone, so. <laughs> so just trying to wrap up, I have two last questions. Um, so there's a saying in your book, New Heritage, just going back to your thesis, um, and because of the theme of this conference, business as a force of, you know, of, an, of nation building, you say heritage design ideation had apparently solved in ages past the most pressing problems confronting us in creating sustainable shelters for humans and human processes today. And we'll be well served to learn from these ideation principles. So just for us to unpack it a bit, you know, in a few mi minutes, um, talk to me about the new heritage. Sometimes principles. I, I wonder, did I write those dense sentences? <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I wrote every word of new heritage myself, and I had to sack my editor who knew nothing about Africa and was sabotaging everything I wrote. She was just a nuisance. So, but you don't know her name, so I'm not gossiping good. <laughs> So the first thing is that architecture is about national identity. You have to understand, architecture is about branding. It's about how you want to be seen. The pharaohs created the, the, the pyramids because they want to live forever. It's about immortality. So this is why heritage is design is very, very important. Hitler would have been nothing without Albert Speer. Google him. So he did this design of a new Berlin. So you knew where we were all going as this, as this white Aryan race. A new civilization is going to spring from the ashes. And always an architect saw it. As they did the Pantheon, mm. even if Marcus Agrippa commissioned it, do you get it? So heritage design principles that I went, I got seven yeah. that have guided my own journey for the last 35, 36 years. One is contextual veracity. Our buildings must look like they came from here. How many people remember Wakanda? Sorry, Wakanda yeah. in Black Panther. You watched Black Panther. Yeah. You look like you did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says designed by an immigrant. That's what he's wearing. OK, so he did watch Black Panther. Now, if you notice, when they were flying over Wakanda, what did they say? I never tire of this site, mm -hmm. right? It's OK to like Black Panther. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> so and what they were trying to say is that each city, each locale should have its own character. So how come I'm flying over Nigeria and it looks like Lagos and it looks like a bad copy of Dubai or Sugar Land, Texas? It shouldn't. 
There should be contextual veracity. You must be true to context. Oxford, a perfect example. A code in place as to the height of the buildings. The same thing with Jerusalem, it must be limestone. Why? Enforced to make sure that you are true to context. Mm. So it's about national identity. When mm. that is in place, you land in Venice, immediately you know, I'm in Venice. Do you get what I'm trying to say? That is one principle. Another principle I talked about was functional art, which I've spoken about before. Let's make sure that the torn pages of our history come back to us. Mm. Macron is doing a good job about that. I'm sure he'll talk to the Brits about it too. They will stop lending us our artifacts and probably just let it come back, you know? So we also look at um, a principle I called climate responsive buildings. Buildings that work for their climate. There's actually something called tropi tropical architecture. Our people had courtyards, they had eaves. There's dif different things. This is about sustainability because we don't even have the infrastructure to power the buildings we're building in Africa. So I go to, how many people know of Eco Atlantic? Good. You see, hermetically sealed buildings, buildings in the tropics that you cannot open one window. Meanwhile, there's no power. <laughs> How do we cope? Do you see? So that means we're loading the future generations with a debt that they will never pay. OK. Then now we talk about the zeitgeist. So I have seven principles. I'm giving you only four. Yeah. The zeitgeist is about the spirit of the age. The spirit, I'm giving you five because you deserve it. The spirit, the spirit of the age. You need to when uh, this, this, the interface with leadership and the spirit of the age is that you should understand the aspirations of a people. Every immigrant in this room, your incentive to leave your countries in Africa was inversely proportional to your perception of ever optimizing your potential. Yeah, let me unpack it. Where you looked and you thought there's no hope. It is incentivized you to get out. But if it was the spirit, if your leaders understood the spirit of the age and understood how to communicate hope to young people, to say, hang in there, there's hope. You'll be there today. Hmm. Then Gassam Kanzberg, that's a German word, we're global, aren't we? So Zeitgeist, Gassam Kanzberg, it talks about a holistic work of art. And that comes to architecture as leadership team building. Hmm. Knowing a little about With everything and everything about a little. Yeah. So you see a Baba Guana who did the Friday mosque in Zaria, stunning building, in mud. You see how he detailed the arches. So he was the engineer, the architect, the ornamenter, the sculptor, the painter. And that's what a leader must be. Hmm. So that when somebody comes and gives you this hug, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> I want to choose the right language. It gives you this, this, this non-workable COVID policy. You can say, this won't work. Hmm. Because of the little you know about viruses. Hmm. Do you get what I'm trying yeah. to say? You don't have to know everything in depth. Yeah. But you need to know a little about everything. Then that's your field. There must be, no be nobody better than, than you in the room in that field. Thank you. Thank you. Can we just give this a little hand? Wow. Thank you. Um, you're simply phenomenal. Always phenomenal. I have written you down. You're too kind. You are kind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm written down so many things, and you know, just to wrap up, it's amazing how you've touched on the architectural principles and how that helps every leader in any business. You know. Um, Talking about vision casting, just putting that side by side, vision casting, communication, um, you know, the teams, just thinking around it and mm. looking back. I'm like, it's very interesting that we should, uh, I think everyone should try to get a copy of the book New Heritage if you can. Um, it will be very interesting for you to see how you can put it side by side with what you do currently. And there's so many key takeaways that, you know, we've had, but we're out of time, mm -hmm. and please don't mob this, I don't know, in the, in the lobby. But uh, thank you so much. We totally appreciate this opportunity to have spoken with you and learned from your journey. And I hope you were also very, um, it was also very exciting for you. Thank you so much, and this is the end. Thank you. <laughs>